people welcome to my channel Jerry in stitches this is Jerry and I am so happy that you have joined me for another week of happy sewing yeah and what's given me a lot of happiness these past few days is sewing up the valley dress from pattern fantastic and this dress is truly fantastic if you want a full pattern review, please go to my blog, jerryandstitches.com, and you can read all about it there. However, the main event of this video is me showing you how I stitched this sashiko pattern on one of the front yokes of my dress. And this stitch is truly exciting because it's one of those stitches that is like a uh, minimum effort, but maximum va va voom results. Look. It looks complicated, but it's actually very easy to do. And if you are just as excited as I am, and you just want to jump straight ahead to the timeline where I start stitching this up because you don't care for all the stuff that I'm talking right now, then look at the timeline and go there. Right, before I forget, I want to say a little something about the fabric choice. This is a Merchant and Mills linen in a mustard and light pink. You can't really pick out the light pink on camera, I think. But in real life, there's a real lovely pinkiness here also. And uh, it's a very crisp linen, but it also moves and flows uh, perfectly for this dress pattern. But the best thing about this linen is that it's a gingham that comes on a half inch grid and for sashiko you have to do the stitching on grid lines to align the patterns and this half inch grid saved me from drawing at least half of the lines because i'm working most of these patterns on a quarter inch grid so i don't know if i showed you the back those are two lovely stitching patterns um, and I'm sorry I'm not showing you those patterns today. I have to leave some content for future videos. <laughs> and if this is uh, the kind of content that you're interested in seeing more, please leave a comment in the comment section. And if you want to buy this fabric, uh, please go to Minerva. This was gifted to me as part of the Minerva Brand Ambassador Program. So go to the link, get your fabric. Just so you know, I definitely did not invent this sashiko pattern. Oh no, sashiko patterns have a long evolved history of uh, Japanese families passing down their patterns from generation to generation. And a good resource for me uh, since I started sashiko is the Ultimate Sashiko Sourcebook by Susan Briscoe. And I refer to this constantly for a whole library of amazing stitching patterns. But what's been rocking my world these days and what's been really giving me the sashiko feels with this project is that i finally got myself a ring yo guys <laughs> this is the traditional sashiko thimble and i enrolled myself into a course an online course with upcycle stitches so that i can learn how to do sashiko the traditional way with the thimble with the needle and I have to learn this whole process called unshin, which is um, the movement or the rhythm of the needle while you're stitching. And it involves uh, coordination between two hands uh, in order to stitch. And guys, it's been amazing. I'm so happy that I'm in this course. I'm still doing it. And I use this dress as kind of like a practice. And you will see me stitch uh, using unshin, very slowly because <laughs> it's kind of like a steep learning curve and I'm a beginner uh, learning Wunshin and these uh, te traditional techniques. So if you really want to deepen your sashiko practice, go to Upcycle Stitches. I highly recommend their course. Sashiko started out as a mending technique in Japan, but what I use it mainly is to decorate and personalize my garments and um, i'm gonna try and see if i can show you all the garments that i have done so far and decorated with sashiko so uh, this is my most recent project and let's go to the first the first one is the blanca flight suit by closet core patterns there's sashiko in the pockets and sashiko in the back 
number two is my morning glory top. Another Blanca flight suit and I'm really proud of this because the koi fish that you see on the pockets and the back was designed by me. Self-drafted Mandarin top with Pietra pants by Closet Core Patterns. The Sienna shift dress by Sew This Pattern and I modified it by adding a high Mandarin collar, sashiko details and a cutout in the back. Yeah. The Ashton Top by Helen's Closet Patterns and you would be able to see how I stitch all these patterns in the front and the back uh, through the thread blog by fabricstore.com Oh yeah! Huh? And this is the Pona Jacket also by Helen's Closet Patterns and I saved it for last because it's also my favorite and I spent a hundred hours of sashiko stitching this up Underneath, I'm also wearing another Ashton top that I've put Sashiko on. And I'm just gonna slow down here and show you some of the details of the jacket. There's also stitching in the under collar. And it's all around stitching with Hitome Zashi Sashiko. And I love this and I love Sashiko. And that's the end of the fashion show of my Sashiko garments. And I wanted to do it not just to give myself an excuse to wear all of them in the same day, <laughs> but also because I have the secret agenda of infecting everybody with the Sashiko virus. And that's because Sashiko really helped me get through this pandemic year. Um, this simple act of going stitch by stitch uh, placed me in the vibration of acceptance and peace in the midst of all this um, loss, uh, disappointment and grief that happened in the pandemic year. And if there's a craft like Sashko that you've been thinking uh, to do, stop thinking, just do it. I encourage you to uh, dive in because it will give you lots back in return. And if I can make something uh, beautiful out of terrible circumstances, so can you. And that's what's really exciting about Sashiko. Um, it's really all about the spirit of mending, renewal, rejuvenation, uh, taking something that looks torn and broken and just rejuvenizing it, revitalizing it and making it completely amazing. Sashiko helped me to accept uh, the act of slowing down. Uh, that slowing down is worth doing uh, because I get so frantic and filled with adrenaline and this addiction for speed that I forget that there's a different vibration that I can live in. And it kind of paralleled what the pandemic was forced onto all of us, I guess. We were all uh, forced to do nothing or uh, just not go through with plans. We were all forced to not plan and that was like really difficult. Uh, but Sashiko helped me through it because um, I just did things one at a time, one stitch at a time, you know, and th that really helped me. And in um, Israel, uh, to encourage somebody to slow down and to do things one thing at a time and not be so frantic, we say here, para, para, which means like uh, literally translated, cow, cow. Yes, like a moo, moo. Um, <laughs> I imagine like uh, Mr. Kibbutz Sr. is telling Mr. Kibbutz Jr., don't milk all the cows at once, milk them one by one cow by cow and you know how in israel we always need to shorten everything so instead of cow by cow it is now cow 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 that's a really good uh motto to live by stitch by stitch guys which um, is a great segue to the next segment where i go stitch by stitch stitching up this beautiful pattern so meet you there so we're looking at the fabric piece for the front right yoke and the gingham of the fabric is already providing a half inch grid and all we have to do for grip preparation is to draw in lines in between the checks for a quarter inch sashiko grid also notice that i've surged all the raw edges of the fabric to keep the piece from fraying 
So what I'm using is an erasable marker, and in my hand is a Friction Pilot Pen in blue ink. And with the help of a clear plastic ruler, I'm drawing in the horizontal lines, making sure that these lines are in between the lines provided by the gingham so that the quarter inch grid can be as accurate as possible. And all the vertical lines have already been drawn in. I don't know if you can see it on camera. So what's left to do for the grid is to fill up the horizontal lines. And there you go, here it is. Grid preparation is vital for accurate stitching in sashiko and it's important that we take our time with it. Traditional sashiko uses a back stitching method to secure the ends of the thread, but in this project I'm using quilter's knots to do the job because I'm not using traditional sashiko thread. I'm using cotton pearl embroidery thread with a silkier feel and I am using knots as double security to keep from unraveling. Before we go ahead with stitching, it's important to draw in the seam lines for the fabric piece. So careful reading of the pattern instructions is required to draw in accurate seam lines. So for example, the seam allowance is a quarter inch at center front, but moves to three eighths of an inch on the bottom, side and shoulder seams. Then it's back at quarter inch at the neckline. Again, I do this with my friction pen and the seam lines are important because they help demarcate the stitching area for our sashiko. For the woven cross diamond stitch, I start off by sewing running stitches on the horizontal lines. Here's a tip. On the right side of the fabric, the width of each stitch does not start from the edge of each quarter inch square to the next. I like to keep the width just slightly smaller than quarter inch, which means that the stitches on the reverse side will be wider than the ones on the front. To sew on the next row, alternate between gaps and stitches and continue down the length of the fabric piece. Just keep going. I am showing you the reverse side of the fabric to show how I keep close attention to thread tension all the time. The stitches that connect between the rows must have the right amount of slack to prevent puckering of the fabric. So you can see this particular stitch is too tight and needs some more ease. But too much ease is not ideal as well, especially for weaving or thread looping patterns because the ease might transfer to the stitches on the right side. So take your time to find the right amount of ease and the right thread tension. I do this by constantly checking for thread tension, especially after finishing every row, and I continue doing this as I stitch down the length of the fabric. The first layer of stitches applied to the fabric is the foundation and sets up the tone for the next layers of stitches. So pay attention to this. At some point in time in the stitching, the thread is going to run out. And Susan Briscoe of the Ultimate Sashiko Sourcebook recommends a way of tying the ends of the threads together in the following way to connect the finished end of one thread with the new end of another. So the one tip of the new thread is going to start behind the finished end of the old thread, then loop a length of new thread around and allow it to fall between both new and old ends of threads. Then the finished end of the old thread is going to thread through the loop we just created and we're going to ease it through slowly. I almost have it and oops, wait one more try and there it is. Okay, now I'm going to put both ends of the thread in one hand together. There we go. And then I'm going to pull with the other hand to tighten the knot. And ta-da, there it is, a knot to connect both threads in order to create a continuous length of thread for stitching. And the new thread can be now threaded through um, the eye of the needle for more stitching to be done. There you go, the new thread. And let's thread it through. yippee yay yay now I've completed all the horizontal stitches and I'm moving on to sewing the vertical stitches for the pattern. As you can see, I've already started on the first column of running stitches and these vertical running stitches cross in the middle of the horizontal stitches making a cross pattern. The sewing pattern for the vertical stitches is to sew one column, then skip one column. And so you see I'm skipping this column here and starting my crosses on the next column. 
The horizontal stitches were sewn on the lines of the grid as a guide, but these vertical stitches are not going to have any grid lines for guidance. What I do here is basically to eyeball the position of the vertical line when these stitches are crossing the horizontal stitches. And it's all about the eyeballing right now, um, using the horizontal stitches for visual reference. And you will notice that the pattern is going to produce crosses um, that line up horizontally on the pattern with one skip space in between. And this is what we're going to continue uh, doing uh, throughout the breadth of the fabric piece. And um, here, I just want to show you what it looks like. Remember to keep your eye on thread tension. And we're just going to keep going. And remember, do one column, skip one column. So truth be told, I was sort of shy showing you my first attempts at Unshin, and then I thought it'll be good to document all this awkwardness because this is how it looks like whenever I'm learning a new skill. So um, I'm going really slowly, so I'll speed it up so you don't die of boredom. And I just wanted to give you an idea of my beginner struggles. And please do not do as I do. This is definitely not representative of what the ideal onshin is. Go to upcycle stitches for proper reference. And here I am finishing up this vertical column of stitches. And um, again, when you're pulling through multiple stitches when you're uh, doing a running stitch, uh, thread te tension is very important, so keep your eye on it, please. So at this point, we've finished stitching the horizontal and vertical stitches, and we're ready to weave through them. And this is the fun part. Uh, we're going to create the woven diamond pattern, and I've already started off on a few passes to show you what it looks like. And to start off a new weaving pass, I stitch in the seam allowance, finding the midpoint of an imaginary horizontal stitch. So I'm going to place it somewhere here. There it is. And we are going to weave through um, the stitches by using the blunt end of the needle, which is where the eye of the needle is, so that we don't snag into the threads and the fabric. And this is the weaving pattern as we make these wide Vs. We're going to go through a vertical stitch and then through a horizontal fit, uh, stitch uh, at a diagonal and then reaching to the other end of another vertical stitch. So that's uh, what it's going to look like. And that is one half of a wide V, which is part of a diamond pattern. And then we're going to now weave downwards moving through a horizontal stitch and then another vertical and then moving upwards through a horizontal stitch and then another vertical and basically that's the pattern and we're just going to keep going until we come to the end of the row and there it is. Now we've completed one half of the weaving pass and you can see half of the diamond pattern being formed. What we have to do now is to go back the same way and weave the other half of the diamond. So we are first securing this weave pattern that we just did by stitching into the seam allowance at the midpoint of an imaginary horizontal stitch and then come back up almost at the same place. And then I am going to cross the first wide V uh, at the other diagonal. So I'm going to find um, a vertical stitch and then pass downward through um, a horizontal stitch and another vertical and then going upwards. And as you can see, diagonally, I'm uh, the second row of wide Vs are, is crossing the first row of wide Vs. And when we are doing this, we are completing the diamond pattern. So to finish off, again, we need to secure this uh, row of white Vs. Um, and then we're going to move on to another row, uh, again, stitching into the seam allowance. And we're just going to keep continuing this pattern, going back and forth and up the fabric piece. 
And ta-da, here's the woven cross diamond pattern. As you can see, it wasn't so difficult to stitch up something so beautiful. And I'm going in for a closer look so that you can see every cross within each diamond. And now I'm gonna stitch up the rest of my yokes for my dress. So these are all the embroidered pieces for my dress and these yokes are going to be protected by full facings which I am going to show you how to do. First, for the extension of the center front opening in the skirt, we are using the original facing piece J that comes with the sewing pattern and this is the only facing piece that we're going to use as is. And there are other facing pieces, E, F, and G, that we're going to disregard because they will not fully protect the reverse side of the embroidery on the yokes. Instead, we are going to use full facings that are made out of the exact same pieces of the front and back yokes. And I already have the fabric pieces cut out. Here's the right uh, front yoke facing and the left front yoke facing. And I also have the back yoke facing here. And I've also sewn in the darts, as you can see there. And also remember, there's another facing piece, which is the J that I showed you on paper. And you have to cut out a fabric piece for this one as well. And now we're ready to sew up the facings. <laughs> So the front and back yokes are going to be connected at the shoulder seams and uh, we're going to do the same thing to the facings and I've added a pressing line for the seam allowance on the bottom edge and on the side edges all the way around in preparation for the facings to be hand stitched to the dress later on. And uh, oh, by the way, I am wearing my Ashton top and it also has Sashko on it <laughs> and okay i've lost my train of thought uh, yeah uh, now these two pieces need to be connected together at the starting from one side of the vent center front parting um all around the front neckline back neckline back to the other side of the neckline and down the other vent so it's a whole stitching line connected and you want to unfold the pressing line when you uh, sew up this whole seam. So I've sewn up the yokes to the facing pieces um, with this seam all the way around and the curved uh, seam needs to be snipped in so that it'll make it easier to fold it over. So I want to show you this. As you can see, very close to the uh, seam line are uh, the, the stitches. So when you make your snips, you want to be careful that you're not slipping into the embroidery threads. And basically, that's it. Um, you want to check both sides uh, just to make sure, both sides of the yoke pieces, just to make sure that you're not cutting into any of the stitches. It's very important. If we cut into the stitches, then it's a disaster. Don't go there. We have to make little snips into the corners where the neckline meets the center front vent or the center parting. Uh, but before we do that, we have to remember to insert the front ties into the uh, top, uh, near the top corner. And the way I do that is to, uh, undo some stitches and insert those straps in. Um, once they are inserted, then I make the snip into the corner. And once that is done and you've snipped into all the necessary curves of the neckline, then I fold the facing over and understitch the facing to the seam allowance as much as I can. You won't be able to get uh, the whole seam line done. Um, uh, then we can press it and the wrong sides will be facing together. So I'm gonna get all of that done and come back. There are some tricky parts to understitching that I want to go through. So first we have to make sure the seam allowance is always underneath the facing pieces and not under the yokes. And I am using my finger to check that it stays 
under the facing pieces without slipping over to the other side. When I sew, I've got the needle very close to the seam line on the side of the facing pieces, about one eighth of an inch away. And as I said, we want to be able to sew down the whole seam, especially when we get to the corner of the center front neckline, which as you can see, I'm approaching right here. So when we get to this place, uh, we just need to backstitch um, and we, we kind of have to surrender sewing up the corner <laughs> or understitching the corner. So here am I, uh, I'm backstitching here and we're just gonna complete that uh, stitching line, uh, cut off the threads here and then we're gonna start another stitching line as close to the corner as possible uh, the same way that we just did. The yokes are now attached to the facing pieces. The front ties are in. I snipped, I understitched, I pressed, and the wrong sides are facing together. And when you've done that, it's gonna look something like this. Okay, and now um, the front and back yokes are ready to be attached to the skirt and sleeve pieces. Okay, at this point, I've attached the front and back yokes to the front and back skirts. Very exciting here. And I wanted to show you what it looks like on the reverse side uh, where the front facing is. And if you're using the extension uh, to lengthen the front vent, there's another facing piece here that attaches the front yoke to that facing piece. And this is what it looks like the seam uh, allowance for this um, facing has been folded under and it's, a, it's sewn on to the front yoke facing this way. And the whole back and front yokes are now ready to be hand sewn later on after I've attached the sleeves to the dress. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, so I'm back and now I've pinned the facing down to the dress and um, all the way around. So there you can see and also the back. Okay, so I kept threatening <laughs> that I would hand sew the facing down onto the dress, but there's been a change of plans. I think, um, it's a better strategy if I stitch in the ditch from the right side of the garment. So I'm, I'm going to hand baste uh, the facing onto the dress and then I will stitch in the ditch to make sure that I will, that the facing will be aligned when I'm sewing it and I can't see it when it's facing down on the sewing machine. So. Maybe I'll show you a little bit of how I'm stitching in the ditch. The only tip I have for stitching in the ditch is to go slowly, yes, slowly, so as to get the stitches precisely in the ditch. You can of course stick to hand stitching the facings down, but either way, I think using full facings is the way to go for this dress because it hides the gathered seams of the skirt and sleeves really neatly. And even without embroidered yokes, I would use full facings for future makes. And once the facings are sewed down, then the dress is almost done. So this is the moment where my body is flooded with dopamine and endorphins because the last stitch was put in. So I wanted to share this with you and voila, here's the dress. And now all that's left to do is to dance. And if you like this content, please hit like, ring the bell, subscribe to my channel and follow me on Instagram at Jerry in Stitches. Always remember to end off every sewing session with a little dance to appease the sewing gods. And also remember, paga, paga, cow, cow, moo, moo, guys. Huh? Or from the land that I was from, ban, ban, gya, man, man, lei, yapo, yapo, lei. Or slowly la, pegi, palahan, lahan. Ah, leat, leat, shui, shui, guys. Because that's what sewing is all about. We slow down, nice and steady. You'll get there. And in the meantime, uh, before I fly off, I want you to know that I'm so happy 
that you've been with me this whole time and happy sewing and happy dancing. Yay! <laughs> I'm back and the oh. <gasps> be excited about this and if you're just ex as ex bleh. Bleh. sewing bleh. however the main event of this video is me showing you how I sashiko however for however the main of however the however the main out in the back oh <laughs> and I love this and I love Sashiko I just dropped the transmitter I hope it still works this is a my check my check my check please work <laughs>